Great. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Thank you, Patrick. So the next demo, as Patrick mentioned, is about cross-domain. It's not just about provisioning per se. It's about how you integrate provisioning into the customer's processes and tools. Um, that's the focus of this demo. And as Patrick mentioned, uh, Workflow Composer coming from StackStorm, it is cross-domain. Initially, when Brocade acquired StackStorm, it, it, it was cross-domain, but there was no networking part of it. So the network domain is what we developed within Brocade and now Xtreme. That's called automation suites. So automation suites basically include, we have two of them. One is network essentials. That includes basic building blocks for network automation. So these are nuts and bolts of automation widgets or Lego blocks that you could use as part of a workflow. And then these, um, what we build network essentials is abstracted so that all of the extreme data center products are abstracted into single interfaces. So the customers don't need to worry about which device they are interacting with. So that's a, uh, one of the automation suites. And the next one is data center fabric automation suite. It includes complete data center automation, in infrastructure automation, like fabric provisioning, adding switches and things. And then also tenant provisioning. That is the demo I'm going to use where you basically, how do you provision switch ports when you are adding a server into a fabric? So these two are there and Network Essentials is free. Anybody can download as part of the StackStorm. So just to set the context here, uh, as you see, it's just an example. Not, not every customer may use the same model. So typically, um, there are multiple roles in an IT organization where, yeah, if, if application team needs a server, so the systems admin kind of communicates with the network admin, the specific application requirements in terms of VLANs, uh, uh, any specific requirements that application needs. So based on that information, network admin basically decides what kind of uh, rack, what rack and port the application server needs to go in and what are the settings for these ports. So the network admin opens a ticket and the ticket comes into a server installer or it may be some other IT resource who goes and installs a server in the data center and closes the ticket. <laughs> so there are different tools involved in this process and uh, so uh, Workflow Composer are coming with multiple integrations. So we can basically hear the concept is how do we not only provide automation for networking, but integrate with the tools and processes customers have? So in this model, these, because of this uh, model, network admin and server installer, they're kind of decoupled. They do their jobs at different times. There is no feedback loop. And if there is a, a mistake, the next day network admin finds out there was a problem, and then they have to probably go and correct the issues on the data center you know, physically. But once the uh, server installer closes the ticket, network admin basically uses any existing tools and scripts, could be CLI or any common scripts, or maybe management tools, and then configures the ports, and then potentially needs to go and test those uh, configurations. It could be done by the same person or a different person. So there is, there is a lot of manual processes there may be some, some space where the vendor tools or management tools fit in, but still it involves multiple hands. There is room for errors. So with automation, the process changes. Uh, there are some processes that remain the same. Here, uh, design process of what kind of ports to pick and what configurations to go, that's still a manual process. So what we're saying is once the installer installs the server, with the cross-domain integrations that come with Workflow Composer, the installer can simply send a Slack message that basically uh, is an alias, is a shortcut for a workflow. So that Slack message executes a workflow on Workflow Composer, and then Workflow Composer, uh, using the information that is already designed by the network admin, 
gets the required parameters for those ports and executes the workflow. And also as part of the after workflow configuration is complete, workflow also automatic verification steps are done and then make sure everything is working, then sends the notification on a Slack message. So here, it doesn't completely eliminate a human uh, interaction, uh, human processes in terms of design, but it does eliminate some of the things that can be automated, reducing errors, and then reducing the time to get the job done. So <coughs> before I go into the demo, This is basically workflow, uh, workflow Composer UI. Uh, what you see is the history that shows you basically what actions have been done and uh, what succeeded. Green and red indicates that. And here, these are the automation suites. What you see here is our data center fabric automation suites. And when we are building data center automation, infrastructure automation, it can be mostly self-contained because it is, it's about infrastructure. One time the administrators can define the basically range of parameters for the infrastructure as they keep adding switches. Infrastructure basically allocates, automatically allocates uh, addresses, ASNs, and automates the infrastructure provisioning. But when it comes to tenant provisioning, a lot of things are managed by customers, application teams, the requirements vary from each application to application. And that's where uh, what we decided is we build our workflows as what we call them turnkey workflows with all the required parameters that need to happen on the network with some defaults, but if they want to customize, they can customize it. But the input is coming from outside our automation suite. So this complexity increases as the customers use L3 tenants versus L2 tenants, and there will be a large number of inputs that are coming in. That's where our intention is, it's not that users will continue to enter this data in these forms. It is initially to get started, but eventually they can integrate these turnkey workflows with their tools and processes. So these workflows themselves get executed automatically. That's what we call last mile automation. Uh, uh, last mile automation. So that way, uh, we're basically taking away a lot of human interaction and make the workflows run triggered automatically through integrations. So here is the Slack. Um, integration. Um, Slack is great because it's kind of, with chat apps, it's kind of, a, it's a different operational model where the humans, automation, and tools can be transparently integrated into this channel. You have basically history of what executed, what was done, what is being done, also is there. So as a, as a collaboration platform, it is great. So here, so we can customize based on a channel, based on a work group, what specific workflows can be available in that Slack channel. Here, um, we have some of the workflows that are available. One of them is called configuring a ports. So the operator, the installer has uh, basically got the work order for configuring uh, a server on rack 100 and port 3. So once he's wired up, he will execute this command. OK, great. And that command basically uh, triggers workflow. And the workflow includes multiple steps. One is it goes and gets the data that is designed, persisted by network admin, and that includes what specific management IPs of the switches, the VLAN, and many other things. What MTU size, there can be a ton of parameters. So it gets from there based on the design, and it starts configuring on basically uh, 
multiple switches here. And what are we using to talk to the devices here? So the devices we talk to, depending upon the device, yeah. Yeah. like we use a REST interface mm -hmm. for most of our uh, data center. If the device is legacy, we use CLI. Mm -hmm. And all this interaction is abstracted into our network essentials automation. Mm -hmm. Just one question. How would be the output, for example, this port is not available for some reason, yeah? Um, do you get an error or what kind of output do you get on the Slack channel? On the Slack channel, it again, it's up to us. Uh, right now, for this demo, basically I said a simple message saying it's down. But next demo I'll show you, we could also pick up specific state of the interface and put it in there. Okay. Uh, I, and that is uh, just to show you quickly the workflow itself. So, the, so Patrick mentioned we have a workflow designer, um, which is basically gives you graphically how to uh, build a workflow. Sorry, I don't have a mouse. <laughs> okay, so this is this is one of the workflow we just executed from the chart apps. So workflow is nothing but a director graph of these actions. Actions can be anything from here. Um, here I'm using the network actions from Xtreme and also the chart app actions to publish into the Slack channel. And uh, as we mentioned, there are a lot of integrations that are there. Oops. Like exchange.stackstrom kind of has a lot of integrations that Patrick mentioned. Um, any of them can be used here. So in this case, this workflow basically what it is doing is getting the data from an Excel sheet for this demo because still a lot of customers use it or you could use a database or any other tool that customers are using it. You get the data using the key where that is like port and a rack and port as a key. Once you get the data, we have an action that is part of our data center fabric uh, automation suite. It's basically a turnkey workflow. It takes the information from you, from the user, and configures accordingly. In this case, multi-home server. You're adding a multi-home server, so you configure a port channel, VLAN, and all that. So customers use that, and we basically, these turnkey workflows, we test them against our hardware platforms and operating systems, and they can basically embed in their own custom workflows and then integrate with the uh, tools and processes. Here, once the configuration workflow is done, um, we also have validation workflows that basically takes the data and go and gets the operational data from the switch and validates. Is the port channel is already, is, uh, is, uh, it's, is it in a sync state? If they have multiple members, it can verify that. Or if the port is actually up, if the VLAN is actually configured to the port, so it verifies that, otherwise it gives an error. So at least, uh, let's say, in this role, server installer can prove if his work is done and everything is set up and working. Yeah? Yes, okay, yeah. Cool. He can basically, through a Slack channel, verify that installation is done, and then he can move on. Hey, Ram, if I can just add one thing. Now, one of the things that I went through was the ability to incorporate the culture, the, the various unique policies that exist within every organization. So if there was a different policy than what we've built in the demo and what we provide through our automation suites, there's, you can see the code is right there. So there's nothing preventing anybody from adjusting that code to incorporate whatever unique steps they want to include in whatever their workflow is to provision a server. Um, and so that's what, when I was talking about the stuff I was talking about earlier, that's what we're talking about here is completely open, adjust as you need to. We'll give you a foundation with automation suites to get you started and it works great with our gear. Um, but for your unique environment and unique requirements, it's all completely open and, and completely customizable. Yeah. That actually leads to a question I wanted to ask when you said working with our gear, because we're talking about a programmability platform. Yeah. But are we talking about a programmability platform that works only with your gear? I mean, ultimately. 
So, which is fine, <laughs> which is completely fine. I understand that as a business model, but just for clarification. Right. So there are, I think, um, it again depends. We have integrations with, within Stackstorm itself through community uh, for CLI devices. It's called CLI credit, the ability to send CLIs and <coughs> process them. But also integration with Napalm, it's an open source mm -hmm. uh, tool. So basically any Napalm action can be executed through Workflow Composer as part of a workflow. Yeah. Right. So you can basically combine certain actions to work on our devices and also the same workflow can also execute Napalm to make changes or do actions on. For an enterprise, it's looking to, to move in that direction. Transition. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily have a, a, a strong you know, developer team or network software developer, whatever you want to call them in house. And they're looking to bring in some kind of a, 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 a platform in a box that yep. can do all that same stuff without going, you know, without it being a completely greenfield rip and replace of every device. That would be a compelling feature, right. yeah, yeah. which I understand as a business model, you want to sell all your gear as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but ultimately that would be, it would be very, very difficult for me to convince, you know, a CIO of my old company, for example, to say, yeah, we got to get rid of all, you know, 2,400 switches. And right. Yeah. Right. But you, 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 to, you, you caught on to the exact uh, thing that we want to talk about, which is that obviously our automation suites and what we're what Ram is demonstrating here are built for our gear. Yeah. And they're built, tested, proven to work with our gear, turnkey out of the box. Mm -hmm. um, but if you take a look at some of the other uh, integrations, the Napalm that, that Ram mentioned and some of the other tools that we have, there's nothing preventing you from working with other vendor solutions. Yeah. And w in fact, a lot of our customers, like you said, take the uh, automation platform and the automation suites, use that to get started, yeah. and then connect that automation platform with their existing legacy stuff, and it's now it's a good bridge to transition from whatever their old stuff is to hopefully whatever Extreme has. Or, yeah, and yeah. I've seen that. I think I've heard Greg mention it a couple times. You know, you start with automating a closet or a rack, right? And I've, and I've used that because, you know, even in my own organizations where you can't just rip everything out yeah, or, yeah, or, yeah. Or, yeah. or even or even convince your boss to to, to uh, integrate all your devices into your you know your your uh, your your inventory file and right. it's like right. no 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 you're not touching everything right now yeah. not until we're comfortable start small yep. and then you know have some success and move forward from there in fact um, one of the challenges we've had with traditional enterprise customers like I think you even mentioned is that they typically today are limited with resources and skills to embrace, you know, full on, you know, Python code automation. Yeah. And so they need an ability to get started and, and get confident. And as their skills improve and as their needs change, they can grow and grow and grow as this grows. Yeah. And it could just be a matter of just gathering information at first. It doesn't yeah. have to be that you're pushing config right. on That's, that on day one. I, I, tell, I, I tell customers all the time is, look, start, start small and start simple. Yeah. First thing is when you're troubleshooting, you go to a bunch of different devices and you collect information, yeah. just mm -hmm. automate that. Don't automate actions, just yeah. automate collecting of information. Right. And that in and of itself is going to cut down hugely on trying to troubleshoot a problem. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, and also automate the things that you do frequently. It may be not a huge lot of things, right? Just Small, to add to that, yeah. uh, we are seeing even to add to what Patrick said, we are seeing the customers who are coming with a very simple problem which are talking about. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, so we are seeing like customers coming very simple problems, like, you know, initially, which are top of their mind. It, as simple as like, hey, if something goes wrong, uh, can I have like, you know, put together automation to just collect the information and have it go like, you know, sit into Jira or my trouble ticket system or go put on my Slack. I mean, things like that. And once they get comfortable, once they feel like, you know, they have what they need, then we are seeing them moving to like, you know, step two, step three and kind of like starting mm -hmm. their journey. Yeah. Uh, one thing also really quickly uh, just to add. So we've also seen customers, uh, you know, where you, uh, you know, leverage Napalm for Cisco or Juniper Arista. Uh, or even use, uh, you know, some of the Jinja templates that has integration with Workflow Flow Composer because they may have a lot of stale services in the network, which they are really scared to touch, you know. And so they're also trying to do some standardization on that to say, if I can push a standard template to create a service, can I also unplug it? So they're starting mm -hmm. with that as well. Okay, great. Yeah, so... Th 
basically this is the kind of su summary that kind of saying that the provisioning, not only executing something using a tool or a turnkey solution, but how you integrate with other processes and then easily make it available depending upon the role of the user, different interfaces and tools. Here, Slack is very useful for somebody who is not an admin to run certain commands for their job.